We're reading today from Matthew 6 and from verse 19. Let's turn there now. It's Matthew 6. From verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up treasures for yourself in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So then, if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, not for your body, as to what you will be willing, as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air; they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? Two of you, by being worried, can add a single cubit to his lifespan. Why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For all these things the Gentiles eagerly seek. For your Father, your heavenly Father, knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Well, this passage continues the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus lays out what it means to be a part of God's kingdom. And it continues on from a, a section that Rick took us through a few weeks ago. And that section was on prayer and giving and fasting. And the point of it was that when we do these things, when we pray, when we tithe, when we fast, uh, when we do any act of worship, really, we should be doing them, them for Jesus, for God's kingdom, and not to be seen by other people. We should be living not to impress others or to shine a light on ourselves, but for Jesus to pursue the life he wants for us and to shine a light on who he is in doing so. We should be living according to the reality that we who follow him are members of God's kingdom. This raises a very practical question because can we really live like that all the time? Can we really live like we're members of God's kingdom when we live in this world, when we have to deal with the physical realities and necessities before us, when we've got bills to pay, when we've got mouths to feed, when for many of us so much of our lives are spent earning the money that we need to do those things? What if we're put in a position where we have to choose between the two, to choose between this world or God's kingdom, or to choose between God's rules or my boss's rules? And this isn't theoretical. There are many people I've spoken to who have come from different backgrounds but asked essentially the same question. I work in a hospital that's involved in the abortion of infants, I'm part of a business that, if it's going to survive, needs to push the boundaries of what's legal, needs to escape or evade laws or taxes or regulations. I work in a teaching environment where I'm expected to affirm and utilize 
the preferred pronouns of self-proclaimed transgender children. This isn't limited to the workplace. Perhaps you're uncomfortable about how much you drink with friends, but if you try and cut back, then those friendships suffer. You could probably substitute any vice you wanted for that. Drugs, spending, sex, whatever, swearing. The question is basically the same. What do I have to do, or what do I do if I have to pick between living as if I'm a servant of God and maintaining something which is important? Food, shelter, security for my family, friendships, or even a gospel witness. What if to preach the gospel, I have to suspend living like I'm part of God's kingdom for a bit? That might sound strange, but that's the exact rationale by which many Christians have married non-Christians. What do we do when practically to pursue something good, we've got to give up God's rules for a bit? This, I think, is the uh, the question that Jesus had in mind when he spoke the rules or the words we've just read. This is the question I'd like to take up now. How can we live in God's kingdom through the realities of life? Starting with verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. Now this little instruction, it both summarizes the previous point Jesus made that we looked at several weeks ago and it introduces our current topic. And it's essentially to say that when you give, when you pray, when you fast, when you worship, don't do it for the temporary rewards of the world, for fame or for glory or for respect or any, for any of the physical goods that might accompany those. Because all creation changes. That's basically the definition of creation. Creation is that which changes while God stays the same. This is how it's put in Psalm 102 from verse 25. This is a good passage to know. Psalm 102 from verse 25 where the psalmist says to God, Of old you founded the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. Even they will perish, but you will remain. And all of them will wear out like a garment, like clothing. You will change them, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. What does that mean? It means that the difference between us, or rather between God and the creation, fundamentally, is that the creator of the universe is and always has been and always will be the same. He is the one who proclaims, I am who I am. But we and the world around us change. We will not be who we are now and we are not who we were yesterday. Because of the fall, the fact that we change means that we decay. Or you might say, surely God does change. The Bible even tells us that he changes his mind. And didn't God change when the Son, when God the Son took on human flesh, became a human being, and came to dwell among us? God changed when Jesus came to earth. And yes, that's true in one sense. God, God the Son did take on human flesh. And so God does relate to the changing world in changing ways. But according to Hebrews 1, this is what God has said to Jesus. Hebrews 1 verse 10. And this is God the Father speaking to God the Son. You, Lord, in the beginning founded the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain, and they will all wear out like a garment, and like a mantle you will roll them up, Like a garment, they will also be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. Do you see the pattern? Do you notice what's happening here? The author of Hebrews is taking that snippet we just read from the 102nd Psalm, but it's not a man saying it to God here. 
He's reversing it. It's God saying it to a man. God the Father saying it to Jesus. And all that's to say that Jesus is the man who does not change. Unlike cloth and metal and our reputations and ourselves, all of which pass away over time, the power of the Son of God and the power and character of Jesus, who he is, who, what he does, well, more so who he is than what he does, but who Jesus is is fully reliable, completely trustworthy, and it'll last forever. This is why Jesus can say, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. And he finishes this point off in verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He's asking the question, where is your treasure? Where are you investing your time and your wealth and your efforts? What are the goals you're working towards? Are they here on this decaying earth or are they eternal? Are they with the one who does not change? This is not to say that you can't have things, but it's to ask what's the purpose of the things you have? Why did you buy the car you bought? Why do your bank statements look the way they look? Is your spending ultimately directed towards status or pleasure or security, or is it directed towards God's kingdom? Now, I'm not saying don't have hobbies. I'm not saying you should feel bad if you bought anything that wasn't 100% necessary. I'm asking, is your spending or your time or your attention, are these things oriented towards the creation or towards the creator? The problem with this question is that it can be difficult to judge. One of my weaknesses, perhaps, is buying nice Bibles. And, you know, on, on the one hand, what, what could be a more godly acquisition than a Bible? Because, after all, what, what could be better to buy? What could be more for God's kingdom than God's Word? And there are good reasons to buy a nice Bible, because if you use it every day, uh, if it goes through wear and tear, it's going to last better than a poorly made Bible. But I have to be very careful when I buy a nice Bible because I have to consider, am I actually buying this for God's kingdom or am I buying it for my own pleasure? How am I going to stop myself from making that kind of decision? How can we uh, prevent the self-delusion that the things we really only want are the things that are godly to do or to obtain. One, one way to do that would be to scrutinize every single decision we make, to work ourselves into a frenzy, meticulously evaluating and cutting the things out of our life that don't appear God-oriented. That's not the solution Jesus points to. Verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body, so then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. This is one of the more unusual passages in the Sermon on the Mount. It's a bit difficult to understand. But I think that Jesus, as he so often does through this sermon, is getting to the heart of the matter. Getting to the core of the problem. Because the question is not, what are you doing with your time? But it's, what are your eyes set upon? What is your heart fixed upon? Are they fixed upon the fading creation or the eternal God? Are you overwhelmed by the attractions or the fears of the world which is passing away? Or are you overwhelmed by the beauty and the majesty and the goodness of God who does not change like shifting shadows. That's what the Bible means when it talks about the fear of the Lord, being captivated by the greatness of God and having your eyes fixed upon him. 
Because when you're captivated by that greatness, you cannot help but live in the light of God. If you're living in the light of God, if you're living with a startling perception of his greatness, that'll mean different things depending on where you stand with him. If you're far from God, it'll mean trying to escape his gaze like Eve did when she first sinned and ate from the fruit of the tree in the garden. And she was caught. What did she say? She said, it wasn't me, God. It was the snake. That's what we're like when we realize that we're sinners. When we realize that we are all of ourselves guilty before God. We realize how mighty he is and that he is just and that he will judge us. But if you become a child of God, if you're adopted by God, if God has made you a member of his family and a citizen of his kingdom, you can fix your eyes upon God and you can be overwhelmed by the radiance of the one who created heaven and earth, the glory of him who declared judgment on death when he raised Jesus from the dead. You can look upon the one who flooded the earth and and parted the sea and who's destroyed dynasties and raised up rulers and who is the master of COVID and who has effortless control over every great and terrifying thing and every earthquake and every tsunami and every star and black hole. You can look upon the one who rules it all and you can call him father. You can rest in the certainty that you're his child. That's what it means to believe in Jesus. And that's what it means for your eye to be good. To live a life oriented towards God. It doesn't start with second-guessing every decision you made. Meticulously self-examining everything you do. It starts with you experiencing the reality of the living God and calling him master. For as Jesus tells us in verse 24, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. If you're living in the good light of the eye, if you're living in the fear of the, world, uh, of the Lord, then you will not serve money. A self-examination isn't entirely inappropriate because if we examine ourselves and we find that we are serving money, if we're, using our, if we're using our money and our time and our attention in a way that's directed towards status or security or pleasure and not towards God, if you're serving money, then that's a warning signal that you've forgotten how incomparably great God is. The finite has become bigger to you than the infinite. It's like looking at a torch in the middle of the night when you're out of your home and saying, this torch is the best way to, it's the best light and the brightest light that'll help me get home. Well, when the sun comes up, you're going to have a different view of things. But how much greater is God's glory than the sun? Why is it that the things of the world become so much bigger in our eyes than the one who created it? There are many reasons. Pride, greed, lust. But Jesus points us to the most fundamental from verse 25. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Worry, the worries of life, meeting our basic needs. The stress of finding a job or keeping a job. The stress of a rent or a mortgage, which are very real anxieties for many at the moment. The stress of getting the care we need because of sickness or injury. When, when these real and genuine worries enter our lives, if we're not careful, which we so often aren't, then they will begin to look bigger than God. Worshipping God will begin to look like less of a priority. Oh, we'll probably pray more. But 
That'll be the prayers like putting money in a vending machine. Seeking God is the solution to our problems. This misses the fact that the greatest need we have is God himself. And if we have God as our Father, we can be confident in the fact, well, in what Paul tells us in Philippians 4 verse 19, my God will fulfill all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. That's why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6 from verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single cubit to his lifespan? Why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Now, one question that arises when we hear about God feeding the birds or clothing the lilies is, isn't that just nature being nature? Isn't that just what birds do, finding finding food? And isn't that just chance? Aren't there many birds who don't find food and who starve? Aren't there many lilies? Well, how does God clothe the lilies? Isn't, Isn't blooming just what lilies do? These are actually very important questions. They might seem secondary at first, but they're actually fundamental to understanding what Jesus is saying here. Because if we don't understand them, we'll never really understand just how much bigger God is than his creation and then our problems. This is the fact that God is sovereign. It's not just that God is powerful. It's that he is completely and totally and 100% in control. That there is nothing you can do to upset his plans. It's not to say don't work, don't strive, don't put in real effort to pursue God, to provide for your family, to obey Christ. These are important parts of the Christian life. But it's to say that when we do work, We're told in Ephesians 2 verse 10 that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. The greatness of God is present in every part of our lives whether we know it or not. That's why Jesus can say that God feeds the birds. God clothes the lilies. That's why Paul can say in Romans 8 from verse 38 that I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because the greatness of God is so unbelievable and so mind-boggling and he is the one who adopts us as his children. Now this reality that Jesus is pointing to, the reality of the sovereignty of God can be difficult, can raise problems. If God is really in control, then isn't he in control of COVID? Isn't he in control of these terrible earthquakes that have recently happened? Isn't he in control of the illness and sickness and difficulties that my family are going through. Why wouldn't God, if he's in control, stop those things? That's too big a question to answer now, but just for the moment, consider this. Would you rather have a powerful father who decided that these things should happen? or a weak father who could do nothing about them. 
The passages we've read today tell us that we have the former. And because God is so powerful, because he is so awesome, Jesus can say, do not worry then, saying, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Uh, Or what will we wear for clothing? For all these things the Gentiles eagerly seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. This is the this is the center of the Sermon on the Mount. This is what all the Sermon on the Mount is pointing towards is God's kingdom and God's righteousness. And seek these and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I'd like to end with two final comments. The first is that Jesus is not saying don't work or don't earn money. We're told in Scripture that Christians should provide for their families. That's not a contradiction of what Jesus is saying here. But what Jesus is saying is that if making money and providing for those who need us comes before following him and seeking his kingdom and seeking his righteousness. We have forgotten how great and how good God is. The second comment is that when we're told not to worry, we can lay a trap for ourselves. Because we'll see that we're worrying and then we'll worry about the fact that we're worrying. We'll be anxious that we have anxiety. We'll be concerned about making God's creation seem bigger than God himself. We can get consumed with the concern that we're doing something wrong and so we can try and focus on on our efforts and finding worldly ways to prevent that worry. That doesn't work. The only way we can deal with even that worry is to look to God and look to Jesus and put our trust in him because God is bigger than our problems and he's bigger than our worries too. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your revelation in Jesus Christ. Thank you that you did give your Son, that you sent him so that we might know who you are, and that we might know your greatness and your goodness, which is shown ultimately on the cross. Thank you, Father, that we can call you Father. What a beautiful thing it is that we can say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. I pray that you help us see that and that you'll give us comfort and ease our worry by knowing who you are so that we can pursue your kingdom and your righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen.